Hello friends, my name is JJ and welcome to my channel, which I am pleased to say recently passed 600,000 subscribers. If present trends continue, I will pass the big one milli at some point during 2022, fingers crossed. So I'm personally a very big believer in the idea that you can never fully separate a creator from the content that they make and that creators therefore should ideally make some effort to share important facts about themselves to their audience so that the audience can enjoy their works in a properly informed context. And on that note, I thought I would use this video as an opportunity to talk a little bit more about my own political beliefs. For many years, I have gone around identifying as a conservative, which is a term that means different things to different people, including a lot of not particularly good things to many people. And this has led to a lot of speculation about the sort of person that I am and what I really believe and so on. So I figured it was a topic that was worth revisiting, particularly for the benefit of some of my more recent subscribers. So a few years ago, I made a video that tried to explore the idea of conservative philosophy in the broadest sense. That is to say the literal ideology of conserving. And in that video, I talked about how I am a product of a comfortably middle-class, first world family and community, and how my gratitude for the comforts that I have enjoyed has disposed me to be conservative towards the status quo. This is a way that I have felt since I was very young, which I think does beg some questions about how much of our political beliefs are just ultimately grounded in deep-seated instincts of personality. But that is a topic for another time, or possibly another channel. Now, a philosophy of gratitude for the status quo can come off as very self-serving, because of course there are many people in my community for whom the status quo is clearly not doing much in the way of maximizing their comfort or stability or happiness. There is a famous this New Yorker cartoon of fish eating each other with the biggest fish thinking the world is just, which is a pretty good metaphor for the way that philosophy can be deeply self-rationalizing. But I do believe that when you take the 20,000 foot view of life on this continent, it is possible to objectively say that most people here do enjoy a rather enviable quality of life when compared to the rest of the world, and that therefore some disposition of conservative gratitude and defensiveness is probably appropriate. Now, traditionally, right-wing politicians on this continent have spent a lot of time trying to identify the root causes of this societal success. And it is here where I think many of the problems with conservatism as a political agenda can start to arise. I did a popular video a while ago about the rise of evangelical Christianity as the core philosophy of the modern Republican Party in the United States, for instance. I think that this has been a broadly negative development in US politics and one that grew out of a sort of overdetermined conclusion about how important a certain flavor of dogmatic Protestant Christianity was to this civilization. Since I am gay, this is something that you can imagine I have come to feel particularly acutely. I grew up during the height of the political debate over gay marriage, which did a lot to expose the flaws of an excessively religious theory of conservatism, which in this case often manifested in the form of simplistic religious arguments framing gay relationships as a sinful aberration that government could somehow discourage out of existence as opposed to an inescapable part of life. And I do think you see this story repeating today as it relates to a lot of conservative attitudes towards the existence of trans people. Now, the other traditionally identified pillar of civilizational success in the American theory of conservatism is of course a market economy, whether you want to call that capitalism or libertarian economics or whatever. This is a conclusion that I am much more sympathetic to, as well as the corresponding argument that orthodox socialism is antithetical to our traditions of success. Success. One thing that I've been thinking about a lot in recent years is the degree that we live in a heavily consumerist society, and the degree that consumerism, which tends to get a bad rap, actually has a lot of virtues as a cultural force. I've done a few videos on this recently. But of course, it is possible to overdraw this conclusion as well. I think that politicians of the left are at their most persuasive when they argue that concepts like the welfare state have always been part of our tradition too. And thus, there is a certain conservatism inherent in wanting to preserve, say, Medicare. In short, I think that the most intellectually honest form of conservatism is one that is able to assess traditions and institutions from an objective, 
merit-based perspective, as opposed to just a kind of blindly status quo uber Alice kind of way. This is basically the classical style of conservatism, championed by philosophers like Burke, Smith, de Tocqueville, and Mill, where a desire to conserve a tradition is moderated by an assessment of that tradition's functional worth in preserving some larger good, usually individual liberty. Now, the one point I want to emphasize here is that I am describing my own personal philosophical grounding. As I've gotten older and become less interested in formal politics than I used to be, I've come to appreciate the reality that a philosophy that is satisfying at an individual level is often not one that would be strategically wise for a political party to run on. For good or ill, democratic politics is very much a game of communicating simple answers to clear problems by mobilizing factions of the public through persuasive rhetoric and charisma. It is rarely an arena where caution and moderation thrive. The populist takeover of the American right is the most glaring example of this in practice. The idea that the most democratically marketable form of conservatism might actually be its least thoughtful form, the type that relies most heavily on emotional appeals to things like prejudice and paranoia, rather than anything remotely pragmatic. These days, the idea of a conservative intellectual strikes a lot of people as a bit of a contradiction in terms, and I don't think they're necessarily wrong. Recent events have certainly made me feel much less affinity for the label than I used to. Conservative political commentary is only slightly better. I talked about this in a video I made a while ago about the career of the professional political pundit, which was a job that I held for several years but ultimately found unsatisfying. In commentary, as in electoral politics, your motive is often just to pander to people's emotions or use your verbal and intellectual skills to rationalize their pre-existing biases. And there is an art to that, no question, but it is ultimately not the game that I wanted to play. I found that there was just too much of a contradiction between the sort of uncertain and cautious person I feel I am fundamentally and the extreme combative self-confidence a good pundit is supposed to display. But again, I want to be clear that this has been a very personal journey for me, and part of how I have matured and evolved throughout my 20s and become the person I am now at age 37. It is very easy for older people to be judgmental of the political beliefs of those younger than them, particularly the degree that people in their teens or 20s often gravitate towards ideas that can be kind of wild or extreme or just kind of simplistic and unsophisticated. But this is often a very natural phase of life to go through as we attempt to sort out this big and complicated world. And as someone who has now gone through close to two decades of that, I'm now finding myself increasingly interested in trying to make the later stages of this process look more attractive to younger people, so that maybe they are a little bit less insecure about winding up there. I can tell you that I personally feel more happy and confident and wise as someone who has embraced a more pragmatic and cautious view of the world than I ever did in my younger years, when I was very preoccupied with trying to be a super rigid orthodox conservative who only believed the correct conservative things and only made proper conservative arguments, even when that meant ignoring all sorts of logical flaws or contradictions. Life is much easier when you can get comfortable saying things like, I don't know, or maybe they're wrong, and not feel like your whole identity will come crashing down as a result. So the official backstory of this channel is that I started doing it after leaving my job as a Canadian TV pundit, and I quite explicitly did not want to do political commentary on YouTube. Today, I think of myself primarily as a cult cultural commentator, but that said, politics is still very much in my blood, so it is fair to ask how my political identity, however I define it today, fits into the sort of content I make these days. Well, I was thinking that one way you could maybe describe this channel is as an unleft space. Not anti-left or explicitly right-wing in the sense of going around bashing progressives or evangelizing for the right or whatever, but just unleft in the sense that I have a different perspective on things that people might hopefully appreciate as being unique and valuable. A lot of cultural commentary on YouTube these days is done from a pretty consistently leftist or even pseudo-Marxist perspective. You know, where everything is described as being a product of sinister or late-stage capitalism and the American empire is held as this unambiguously wicked force in the world and stuff like that. I don't begrudge anyone who thinks this way. There are a lot of very clever leftist people on this site who make a lot of very thoughtful video essays incorporating these perspectives. But I do personally think it does start to get a bit monotonous when that's the only perspective you ever hear. Not that the explicitly right-wing channels are much better. Conservative YouTube, I am sorry to say, does seem considerably less likely than left-wing YouTube to make videos about anything other than 
partisan dunks on their political enemies, which I guess is kind of a byproduct of the Trump era where this kind of righteous own the libs attitude takes priority over everything else. So while I am not all that interested in identifying with this set, mostly because I don't identify with the super Trumpy, super Christian right flavor of politics they represent, I do hope that perhaps some of my more small c conservative views on things like middle class values or consumerism help make this channel a place for cultural criticism that doesn't just automatically take for granted certain left-wing conclusions that might be conventional wisdom elsewhere. The last thing I want to talk about is just this idea of Canadian conservatism, because this is something that comes up a lot. People from outside of Canada often look at my interest in being a sort of moderate guy and go, aha, this is how conservatives are in Canada. It is so different from how conservatives are in America. But no, I don't really accept this premise. I think your base level conservative party voter in Canada is basically the same as your base level Republican voter, in part because Canadian and American culture is just not really that different, and Canada has never really had distinct political philosophies. The Canadian Conservative Party is structured in a less democratic way than the GOP is, however, which has made it less responsive to its voters and led to the rise of a much more progressive party elite, which might make the party more superficially attractive than the super Trumpified GOP but it has also made the party intellectually empty in a whole other way. Both the Conservatives and the Republicans seem to be facing a pretty significant popularity deficit these days that they don't really seem to have a coherent strategy to escape. The best either party can seem to hope for at the moment is that they can somehow weasel their way back into power by taking advantage of the anti-majoritarian aspects of their respective political systems, which marks a real decline from their heyday in the 1980s when both parties were genuinely quite popular with a majority of voters, including young voters, but that is a whole other story. Now, all that said, I do have a certain residual partisan loyalty to the Canadian Conservative Party that comes from my loyalty to a certain reformist agenda that was quite popular among populist Canadian conservatives in Canada's western provinces during the 1990s. It was an agenda that fixated on a number of particularly Canadian issues that longtime viewers of this channel, or readers of my columns in the Washington Post will know I take quite seriously, including the need to change some of Canada's least democratic political institutions, opposition to national bilingualism and special status for Quebec, and resistance to anti-Americanism. These are all causes that are rooted in my beliefs about the importance of democracy, and my deep skepticism of what I would describe as top-down nationalism, wherein an elite tries to dictate culture on its own terms, rather than allowing culture to emerge organically through an open political system and a free market economy. But while there are a lot of Canadian conservatives who probably broadly agree with me in theory about a lot of this stuff, it would be a real stretch to say that any of this is remotely front of mind for the modern Canadian conservative movement, to the extent such a thing even exists. I think that most Canadians who are identifying as conservatives these days are drawn into the identity for the same reason that most American conservatives are, which is to say the fiery culture war stuff that gets eyeballs to the screens and voters to the booths. So yeah, that is basically what I believe. Now, I'm not perfect. I am in full possession of the capacity to contradict myself or be a hypocrite or otherwise not live up to the ideals I claim to. But hopefully you now have a bit of a clearer sense of where I'm at least trying to come from and some of the assumptions that animate the sort of content that I produce, either implicitly or explicitly. It can be quite an exercise in vulnerability to attempt to lay out your beliefs like this, but like I said, I do believe that creators owe their audiences a fair bit of transparency in order to help them better enjoy what they produce. And hopefully this video has done that for you. <laughs>